welcome. Welcome again to a Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, and the view out these windows could not be prettier. We're going to call that, you know, you know, 18, 19 knots a good breeze. The Wednesday night races are starting soon, so we will not just be confined to looking at this beautiful view during the daytime with boats, but at nights we'll have boats sailing up and down here. So uh, right off the bat, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our Commodore of the St. Francis Yacht Club, Paul Heineken. Paul. I'm, I'm getting used to this. Welcome everybody on, uh, here in the club on behalf of the members and the flag officers and the important people like Ron and all the people out there online who are gonna watch this now and uh, live stream later. Not live stream later, right? It's live stream now and it's delayed stream later. Replay later, right. But uh, the most important thing that's happened around the club in the last week is the Nations Cup which was this world sailing uh, match racing competition between, among nations, uh, not clubs and not individuals, but they really were all from their country. They practiced as a team and their only burgee was their country's flag. And it was a very cool event that Bruce Stone has been spending the last two years um, arranging. So just did a phenomenal job to get everyone here. Yeah. Uh, everybody here, everybody housed, umpires here, umpires housed, uh, uh, weather just like this for the entire time, no significant breakdowns, uh, extremely well run regatta that definitely showed what this club can do with organizers like Bruce and with uh, umpires like Dick Watts. So, so uh, that's the big event that's happened. Now we're heading... Oh yeah, that's right. Nicole... Nicole Brault, who finished a very close second to the French. The French won the men's and the women's division, so clearly they are a force to be reckoned with. And they're very, very good. Uh, they, they spent their nights uh, discussing strategy while staying on boats uh, that Bruce arranged for them right here in the harbor. And uh, Nicole had won the event in Vlad Vladivostok. She was second in this one. So we can clearly say there's no better woman match racer in the world than Nicole Brawl. So that's great. So here, Ron, go for it. Thank you, Commodore. A little bit about future speakers. Um, on, in June, on the 12th of June, Luke Muller will be here. Uh, he is on the United States Olympic sailing team and he's vying for the Finn berth. This will be the last time Finns are the Olympics, so it's a very tough competition. He's dueling it out with uh, Caleb Payne, who is the only medalist from America at the last Olympics. Uh, Allison Langley will be here uh, in June 5th. She's a yachting photographer. She'll be here to talk to us all about the restoration of beautiful classic boats on the East Coast. And she's got a whole slideshow. And this is a special event, and this is the first time it's being announced right now. But on Thursday night, not a luncheon, but a dinner, a special evening dinner uh, upstairs uh, here at the Yacht Club. Uh, and the speaker will be Terry Hutchinson, executive director and skipper of the American Magic America's Cup effort from the New York Yacht Club. So we're looking forward to having Terry here. It'll be a big evening, It'll be a, f a full evening event. Those of you who saw the Paul Kayard evening on Antarctica a couple of weeks ago, it'll be modeled on that one, uh, family style dinner uh, with a great speaker, et cetera. Uh, on May, on um, um, May, tw May 22nd, uh, Barbara Berrigan uh, per per Perala, she'll be here to talk all about saving the Delta, and it needs saving. As you may know, the two tunnels have been turned now into one tunnel, but any tunnel is not a good idea because it'll be taking water above the bay and sending it to Los Angeles, and who would want to have half as much uh, fresh water flushing out our bay? None of us, and all the cities around the bay will be affected by this, so we're going to have a couple of speakers uh, on this subject. She's one of them. Um, Alan Edwards will be here to talk all about his L36 website, which is now in broader use. Bill Lynn, executive director of the Hershoff Museum, will be here on May 8th. Channing Robertson will be here May 1st to talk all about what we can learn from nature about speed and why do golf balls have those nipples on them. 
We got to ask Channing that question. He'll talk about it. May 20 or April 24th, next week, Rick Paulson will be here. He's the chief calligrapher of the White House, and he'll talk about from the White House to White Caps. He's a world, longtime sailor, world, um, you know, a very good sailor, and has sailed his whole life. So he'll be here to talk to us about the calligrapher's journey. Now, a little bit about our speaker today. At you know, before he was, before he knew how old he was, he was going back and forth on the ferry from the mainland to Coronado Island before there was a bridge in San Diego to take you there. He remembers being around four when he went on a fishing trip with his pop in San Diego. And so he spent time on the family fishing boat. His family uh, had had invented a pump called the Rhodes Pump, which was a usage in all Navy ships around the world during World War II. And so he had the entrepreneurial side of his family going. But he also, at this early age, began being fascinated by prehistory. And so all the time, uh, as he was going through um, his life as an undergraduate and then getting his master's in Stanford and ultimately his PhD in Stanford, he was fascinated with history. That's caused him to write only 25 books. <laughs> it's tough. Um, he was pulled out of school at age eight and put in special learning classes because he's got pretty much a photographic memory and was in an advanced educational program from that point forward. He's given or presented over 100 peer reviewed papers and given several thousand talks. And all of this is because he is one of the world's foremost authorities on the Phoenicians, the early sailing maritime Phoenicians and Hannibal and specifically the Phoenician and sea legacy of that great general Hannibal. So please welcome my friend and our speaker today, Patrick Hunt. Patrick. Thank you, Ron, and it's a pleasure to be here again at the St. Francis Yacht Club on the Marina. What a beautiful place. How am I not going to be distracted by this view <laughs> while I'm talking? Well, it is just unbelievably beautiful here, and it's a pleasure to share what I love. Uh, I was just, Ron couldn't read my scribbling, uh, and I did also want to add the reason why I grew up around Coronado was because two of my great uncles ended up as admirals in the U.S. Navy. And so I spent a lot of time there and graduated from Point Loma High School in San Diego over the water as well. Now, I've been teaching at Stanford for about 28 years, and this is where Ron couldn't read my scribbling. Uh, I, my, my MA, my MPhil and PhD are from the Institute of Archaeology at the University of London, UCL. But I've been teaching at Stanford for 27 years. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to be there as a Berkeley alum, too. <laughs> so I want to make sure I have fairness to both sides. Uh, yes. So uh, it is something that uh, some people think I'm obsessed with Hannibal. I'll come back to that later. But we're going to talk a little bit today about the Phoenicians, their legacy. And when I was a grad student many, many years ago, uh, we were examining the Phoenician texts and their maritime exploration. They were amazing sailors. When their boats were dredged up, one of the turning points in the First Punic War, the Romans found that the Phoenicians had built their boats in mass production, sort of by paint by numbers. Every timber had an alphanumeric code on it. So they mass produce these ships and then uh, fit them together. So uh, that was astonishing. They were probably the world's greatest early navigators and explorers. Everybody's probably heard of Hanno the Navigator. And if you haven't, well, I'll just briefly share a bit about Hanno in a few minutes. Well, the idea, Hannibal and the legacy, we'll get to Hannibal too, but let's first talk about the Phoenicians. The, even the word Phoenician, which is a Greek word, comes from Phoine case, which is the red dye, the purple red dye that they had a monopoly in, along with other monopolies that pretty much ran the ancient world's trade. Uh, so this is something that I've been sharing. There's a little bit of this in uh, a book that Simon & Schuster published, uh, and we brought a few copies of it. So what, a lot of what I'm going to be sharing today comes from this book, this book on Hannibal. And it's also, uh, I think, on the screen. Uh, we were very pleased. Uh, in fact, 
I'm, I'm tickled this month and last month, it's been a book of the month for the Ancient History Encyclopedia and has, has done very, very well. So, so thank you. And uh, we're, we're very pleased uh, that it's become uh, a very, uh, well, let's say a, a modest bestseller, a popular book. And I wasn't sure that was going to happen because I thought the writing was pretty uh, dense. Uh, the speaker could be dense too, but the writing was pretty <laughs> dense. In, in any case, uh, let's let's think about what I've distilled into that book. And when you think about the Phoenicians and their trade, many many ancient historians, Diodorus Siculus, he was from Sicily, Siculus, he wrote the Library of History, Bibliotheca Historiae, and he says the Phoenicians from ancient times were skilled in making discoveries for their own profit. They had a mercantile system that really worked in the ancient world. Herodotus said they were uh, almost predatory in their trading. They were so monopolistic. They were very good at what they did, and they navigated by day and by night by the stars. Uh, they left the coastal security of the safe shore and went out in the deep, dark unknown. They were the first to do this, as far as we know. Now, here's what Herodotus says about their circumnavigation of Africa, although he often uses the word Libya, because Libya was what the Greeks knew of that coast of Africa. Africa's washed on all sides by the sea, except where it joins Asia. Technically, it really doesn't, but uh, as was first demonstrated, as far as our knowledge goes, by the Egyptian king Necho, who after calling off the construction of the canal between the Nile and the Arabian Gulf, that was the first Nile canal uh, way back. In fact, there may even been antecedents to that in the Egyptian Middle Kingdom. Anyway, he sent out a fleet manned by a Phoenician crew with orders to sail west about and then return to Egypt and the Mediterranean by way of the Pillars of Hercules. That's the Straits of Gibraltar today. The Phoenicians sailed from the Arabian Gulf, so they went down the Red Sea into the Southern Ocean, the uh, Oceanus Australis, and also known as the Indian Ocean. Notice then, uh, they every autumn they put in at some convenient spot on the African coast, they sowed a patch of ground, grain, uh, put grain in that ground, they waited for the harvest, then they put to sea again. So after two full years, they rounded all the way from Good Hope back to this, the uh, Pillars of Hercules, back to Gibraltar. In the course of the third year, they returned back to Egypt. These men made a statement which I do not myself believe, though others may, uh, to the effect that as they sailed on a westerly coast round the southern end of Africa, they had the sun on their right to northward of them. This is how Africa was first discovered by sea. Now, there are many other people who find it more credible than Herodotus. Uh, we look at you know, oceanic currents, uh, and depending on the primary sailing season, from uh, although it's different, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, the primary sailing system for the Greeks and the Mediterraneans, the Phoenicians, the Romans, etc., uh, was from essentially right now, uh, April till September. And if you strayed outside that, that time, you could be in dire straits, literally. Although in the southern hemisphere, it could be different. You can just see they could follow the coasts down Africa by the currents and then come back up by a different gyre uh, that you can see in the Atlantic. Uh, it would be trickier. They could go by sail, and when they had to, they would go by oar. So here you may know the founding of Carthage, the most famous colony of the Phoenicians. Uh, this picture that I took at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg shows Dido directing the making of the, the, uh, the hill, where, as you may know, the Phoenicians colonized not only the Mediterranean, they colonized out into Spain, Gades, Cadiz today. They colonized New Carthage. They colonized all along the, the Atlantic coast of Spain. They even went up to Cornwall for tin sources. So we know these things. We can actually trace by rare earth elements the Cornwellian tin in some of the bronze that the Phoenicians carried. So they were really great navigators, great explorers, great traders. But you know that when they came to North Africa, to Carthage, they asked the locals for a plot of land. And the plot of land they got, they, these wily locals said, OK, you can have as much land as you can fit into an oxide. Now, an oxide wouldn't be very big, 
So Dido, if you may recall Virgil's Aeneid, Queen Dido, or Elissa of Carthage, what she did, she took that ox hide, and here you can see it in the painting, uh, uh, she had that ox hide uh, cut up into a strip, extremely tiny, like a rawhide thong. Think of those shoelaces. And she took that entire strip, and rawhide is elastic. She got it to stretch out over the whole area which became the city of Carthage. First, just the hill of the Bursa. Uh, there you can see her directing them to cut the hide. There are the scissors and so on. So that's how Carthage was established according to myth. But we actually uh, know a little bits about the explorers. Here's the explanation of Hanno the Navigator that you can see. That's the pretty much a, a comprehensive uh, minimum trip he took. We, we suspect he went much further south than Ghana, but you can see from the Roman historian Arian, and you can also see others who suggest that he, he went down uh, and, and notice he discovered swift-footed pygmies, gorillas, and erupting volcanoes. Well, you'd have to go fairly far south along the African coast, south of Mauritania and the coast, to do that. It became, even in antiquity, one of the most celebrated voyages of discovery ever undertaken. That was probably in the 500s BCE, so 6th, 5th century BCE. And, and notice, this was a Carthaginian explorer. Well, masters of the sea is what the Phoenicians were known for, Carthage certainly, uh, which was very well placed. And myself, I can say, never having lived very far from the smell of the sea. You know, Kathy and I were just talking about this. What is our blood? About two-thirds seawater? Uh, anyway, uh, for me, got to smell the sea. And the Phoenicians must have been the same way. So uh, this is just some of their exploration that you can see. What we, what we would call the Maris Erythraeum, the Red Sea, and the, the, you can see it here in this map. And they went to India. They went down the Red Sea. Uh, they had a lot of trade with India. Notice, whether you think of this as historical or not, in the book of 1 Kings, describing King Solomon's partnership with King Hiram, the king of Tyre, Tyre, the mother city of Phoenicia. Notice their trade uh, compact included so if you look at this, King Hiram of Tyre had ships that brought gold from Ophir. We're not sure where Ophir is. Some say Ophir is the root word of Africa. But from there they brought great cargoes of sandalwood and precious stones. Now sandalwood and precious stones are as likely from India. And we know that they had trade with India. We know that they could take the monsoon winds, depending on which season. They may have to stay in India for a while before they could sail back. But we're pretty sure they brought sapphires and rubies and even lapis lazuli from Afghanistan. Uh, they also na naturally would bring, as I said, the ivory, the peacocks, sandalwood, which would not be a tree from anywhere except at that time from uh, the subcontinent of India. Notice King Solomon also had these ships. where They're called the ships of Tarshish. That just means long-distance travel ships uh, with King Hiram of Tyre's fleet at Essie and Geber. Etzin Geber is just in the Red Sea, Aqaba Gulf, as you probably know. Once every three years, the ships of Tarsus would arrive, bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. Again, peacocks, probably a bird mostly from India at that time. So the trade that the Venetians had wasn't just the Mediterranean. It was very heavily in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. Now, this is their Mediterranean control. They had the southern part of the Mediterranean. The Greeks had the northern part, and you can see that they had stops all along those coasts. There uh, are several shipwrecks, the Ulubrun shipwreck, which is 14th century BCE, showing some of that trade that they had. Uh, and there's a new shipwreck just published, you may know about it, from 1600 BCE, found off Antalya, Turkey. Uh, it's just been out in the news recently. Uh, probably the wood of that ship was Cedar of Lebanon. That was their first monopoly, was the Cedar of Lebanon, because they were right here. I'm not sure you can see my cursor. Where, do you see my little cursor? They were right there. You can see their three main cities, Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos. Uh, so they sailed, and they brought uh, copper from the island of Cyprus. The word copper and the word Cyprus are the same in antiquity, Kupros, the island of copper. 
Uh, so they would trade with that. They were all over the place. They had, of course, uh, a port at Cyrene. Uh, they had the port, the main colony, which was in the middle of the uh, the coast, middle of the Mediterranean here, Carthage. The, uh, the That was a very important port, probably that Dido founded, we think, 9th century BCE. So technically about 3,000 years ago. They had ports and colonies in Sardinia, Tharos being one, the Balearic Islands, all the way Gadiz over here, uh, outside in the Atlantic coast, and others, Cartagena here. So wherever they were, they traded. They were very good at trade. They were very good at making their gods the same as yours. They said, oh, uh, you worship Uni, who became Juno. The Etruscans worshipped Uni. We worship Astarte. It's really the same goddess. Come on, let's make a deal. They were like that. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at this. Now, uh, one of the journals of African archaeology, uh, the Ac African archaeology review that I published in on the great location of Carthage, double protected from storms. And if you look down here, uh, Carthage is right here on this map. And it was inside not just the Gulf of Tunis, but the interior Gulf. So, and the, the gyres that would, the, the water that would flow this way and then this way, double gyres, they were protected by water on all sides. I'll show you a picture I took from Carthage uh, in a little bit. But it, it's astonishing to see how they founded that colony right here. And it's only 100 miles to Sicily across the straits. Now, uh, a lot of Phoenician material shows up in Sicily, in Sardinia, uh, all around the Mediterranean. This is their god of beginnings. Melek in ancient Phoenician means king, and so Melkart is the god of beginnings, the god of enterprise. The god, literally, uh, the Phoenicians were very uh, strong capitalists. Uh, and you can see their material everywhere, different signs that uh, show their hybridity. Uh, and here, this is a picture I took in Carthage. Now. I didn't say this at the beginning. I may have had a slide that said it. Uh, I've been working for National Geographic for umpteen years now as an explorer, expeditions expert, keynote speaker. But recently, I became elected as a fellow of the Explorers Club in New York City. And so so, uh, so I will be speaking uh, also uh, to the Northern California Explorers Club. And I had my inaugural lecture in New York City. And I must tell you some, something about that. The podium. I was welcomed to come up to the New York City Explorers Club uh, podium, and I was welcomed by a scientist to the Hannibal Lectern. <laughs> but it was a bit scary because on that on that lectern there were little brass plaques about previous fellows who had been elected and spoken there. And I saw Teddy Roosevelt's little bronze plaque over here, and I saw Louis Leakey's over here, Jane Goodall's over here, Thor Heyerdahl's over here. Kind of intimidating to be uh, elected to the Explorers Club, but. Nash Graphic, uh, uh, who is really, along with Stanford, my primary employers, they sent me to Carthage to explore. Uh, and so now I'm reaping the benefits of that. Here you are at ancient Carthage. There's the famous secret harbor, the Cothon. We'll look at that in a minute. There's the mountain of Baal across the Gulf of Tunis. And here is the Roman city, because the Romans came and basically destroyed the Phoenician city. But they didn't totally destroy it. You can see the Phoenician city of Carthage down here. And Hannibal lived with his family, the Barkas, Hamilcar Barca, his father. They lived on this hill. And this is where Hannibal made his famous vow to hate Rome. But uh, here, on this particular point, uh, uh, when you think of all that was done here, and I'm going to point out something where my arrow is, the Phoenicians left these little Melkart statue heads everywhere, that god of new beginnings, the king of uh, capitalism. There are heads all over the Mediterranean. You can find these on sites pretty much everywhere where it was 3,000 years old uh, onward, these little Phoenician godheads, the god of enterprise. Uh, they're just everywhere. There are thousands of these little glass bead heads. Uh, now... They had monopolies, as I said. One of their monopolies was in a plant that you might know as frankincense, thanks to the Franks, thanks to Charlemagne later on. But it's, uh, if you know, off of, the, uh, off of Saudi Arabia, the island of Socotra, uh, a really bizarre place, uh, pretty much so many rare species that grow there, but frankincense grows between Oman and the island of Socotra 
off Arabia and even parts of Africa. And they had the monopoly on this. And, and it was very important. Almost every religious tradition in the West uses frankincense as visual prayer with its aromas. So uh, they control that. It's even in Exodus and Leviticus uh, as used in the tabernacle by Moses and Aaron and so on. So a very important plant. They controlled the trade in it because they had the ships. They had the knowledge of the exploration. They controlled the purple-red dye. And in fact, as I said, they're called phoenicase by the Greeks because that was the name for purple-red, this dye. Now, when I was at the Great Harbor, uh, I'm going to go back a slide or two or three. Right there, you can just see what's left of the circular secret harbor, the Cothon of the Phoenicians, and the maritime harbor for their navies as well as for their merchandise, for their trade. And I was standing there and kicking around in the sand, uh, thanks to National Geographic grants, and uh, that shell that you see was down in the sand, half buried. I picked it up. I was given permission. I was given permission to keep it. This was the famous red dye, uh, sort of a gastropod that made that purple red dye. So that's a Murex shell. And I'll pass it around. I just would like it back. Uh, but I'll pass around because this was proof of that red dye trade in their harbor. Uh, there may be others still there, but I only took one with permission. So I'm going to pass it around. Uh, there we have it. So that was one of their, their monopolies. Now, they also traded and had the monopoly in copper. You can see these bronze ingots. They would get tin and copper together. They would make bronze ingots. So uh, all over the ancient world, this one in the Heraklion Museum in Crete, those are ingots. The ship that was just discovered that you can read about if you look it up, Bronze Age Shipwreck, 1600 BCE, had hundreds of these bronze ingots on it too. No doubt Phoenician traders. Now, they also controlled the trade in opioids. Now, that's a dodgy subject today, but remember, Papaver somniferum was, for the ancient world, the divine gift of pain relief. And I think we can all appreciate that. That was the best they had. They literally traded in it. Now, notice in Knossos, Crete, there is a vessel that if you took it off the boat into the harbor wharves, you knew what was in it because it was shaped like the opium, the opium poppy calyx. Do you see that shape? And it had opium traces in it. So they control that trade. You can see the, the calyx there. Uh, now, there even in Crete are opium poppy goddesses because it was a divine gift. Look at the top of the crown. Do you see the crown? It has poppy heads that are slit on it right here. It, they, they controlled this trade in these little glass vessels or the big amphora. So they controlled cedar of Lebanon trade, which Egypt needed, having really no trees to speak of. We can read about the great Wenemut story, the tale of Wenemut from Egyptian, where he basically got snookered by the wood traders of Byblos from uh, trade, trade in the cedar of Lebanon. That's what you were using for ships that were using for timber was Cedar of Lebanon, so they had that trade, opium, frankincense. Uh, they had a lot of sophistication. Notice these seals that they traded with even sometimes hybridized Egyptian motifs on them, carnelian, blue chalcedony, uh, uh, ebony, ivory, all kinds of materials that they had. And they also uh, traded ostrich eggs from Africa. You have these gigantic ostrich eggs that are found even in Etruscan sites because they traded with the Phoenicians. Uh, uh, the Etruscans and Phoenicians traded closely. So here, when we look at the gold, they brought a lot of gold from Egypt. They traded that around too. We have a lot of monopolies that they had. The, the ivory that they shared. Now you may remember a famous archaeologist when I was at the Institute of Archaeology in London and also when I was at Berkeley, in their Eastern studies there, the head of the department, David Stronach, Professor David Stronach, was a student of Sir Max Mallowan. Now, Sir Max Mallowan was the head of the Institute of Archaeology, where I did my PhD, and his wife was more famous. Do you remember Dame Agatha Christie? Well, she went on all the excavations with Sir Max and David Stronach, my mentor at Berkeley. He bust them around in his Land Rover. Uh, and she had a famous contribution, the famous Nimrod ivories. Even the San Francisco Fine Arts Museums have some of these ivories. 
These ivories, they couldn't get the clay off from Nimrud. That's in northern Iraq, not too far from Mosul. They couldn't get the, the reddish clay off, but because she came from England and she was in Iraq in the summertime, she brought lots of moisturizing skin cream, and they gave her the job to sort these ivories, and everywhere she touched one, the clay red powder came off. So they used, they used Agatha Christie's skin cream to clean off all these ivories around the world today. There you are. So she's done more than write mysteries. She solved some mysteries too. So this is the trade agreement the Phoenicians had with the Etruscans. If you know the city of Cerveteri in Italy, not too far from Rome, great necropolis, huge tumuli, hundreds of grave mounds. Pergi was their harbor, Caera, Pergi. And these are the gold tablets that notice you have Etruscan here on the left side and on the right side and Phoenician in the middle. It basically says pretty much, I'm not sure you can read it, but right down here is the name Uni, the god Uni. And as I said, the, the Phoenician said, look, you worship Uni? Ha, we worship her as Astarte. And hey, we've got some ostrich eggs to sell you. <laughs> anyway, this is the trade agreements in gold tablets between the Phoenicians and the Etruscans. They really got around, those Phoenicians. Now, so many people believe, I'm one of them, I've done some of the ampelography and looked also uh, at the wine story. Uh, if you know all the Etruscan wine sites, the earliest wine amphora found in Italy on Etruscan sites are Phoenicians. They brought wine to Italy. It's very likely that Sangiovese came from Phoenicia. <laughs> what do you know? Anyway, so they really brought lots of different things. Now, quickly going to these battles that we had between Rome and Carthage, the Punic Wars, because the Romans knew Carthage as Punica. And you can see here, the purple is the territory of the Phoenicians, the Carthaginians. It's not high population density, and it's multicultural. Many, many different peoples. Libyans, Numidians, Getulans, Mauritanians, uh, the Celts of Spain called Celtiberians, and of course, Carthaginians themselves. But they were a mercantile empire, and they were mercenaries. When they fought, they were paid. They, weren't, they were professional soldiers paid. Rome weren't. Rome soldiers were citizen farmers who would put down the plow and pick up the sword. Uh, they weren't always well trained. And Rome uh, fought the first Punic War over Sicily because Sicily was too close to Carthage. And the Romans only won in the last battle, the Battle of the Geddes Islands, when a storm sunk the Phoenician fleet. So... That's when the Rome, Romans took over the Mediterranean. Now, remember, Hannibal left with his father, Hamilcar. He hadn't seen much of his father, uh, even by 10 years old. His father had been off fighting those wars. Hannibal says, Dad, can I go with you? You're going off to Iberia. You're going off to New Carthage. And his dad said, yes, you can come, my son, as long as you come to the altar of Baal, the temple of Baal, and swear undying hatred to Rome. <laughs> Hamilcar was pretty upset at Rome because Rome had not only taken Sicily, had stolen without a treaty Sardinia and Corsica too and other things. So Hamilcar went across Africa, North Africa then, with an army and 80 baby elephants, all about, and they only crossed at the Straits of Gibraltar, the Pillars of Heracles. And then they, uh, Hamilcar went there because silver was so abundant in New Carthage. Uh, we call it Cartago Nova, today called Cartagena. Then it was called Cart Hadasht Hadasht. Carthage, the new, new. Anyway, Hannibal grew up there, and he, he saw his father leading the armies there, and also uh, he saw his father was stockpiling silver, not just to pay back the treaty indemnity, because Rome imposed a penalty for winning that war against the Carthage. So Hamilcar not only got enough silver to pay off that, he was building a war chest against Rome. Hannibal was raised with that in mind. Now, so again, you saw the picture. There's the Probably the altar of Baal was up here, or it was on the hill where Hannibal swore that vow. If the story's true, there's no reason to think it's not. Here's the secret harbor that I mentioned. And, you know, the, the Carthaginians were pretty amazing. They even had water cisterns on their roofs of their houses so they could have flowing water, maybe even flushing toilets. Who can say? But they had rooftop pools of water and cisterns for gravity-fed water flow. Uh, there is the picture of what we think the secret harbor looked like on the left, 
and here's what it looks like today. And that shell that's passing around I found right there, kicking around in the sand of the ancient harbor of Carthage. So you have a, you're, you're holding a tangible piece of Carthaginian trade monopoly history in the red-purple dye on that shell. Now, uh, you look at the, the way that the territories went between the, the Romans and the Carthaginians. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of detail on that, but because by the Third Punic War, uh, what Rome did was sealed off the, the silver trade. They cut off Carthage, especially Hannibal, from the silver trade. Hannibal was successful as a general with the silver that he could either buy, pay his soldiers, or buy good military intel. He used a lot of Celts, a lot of disaffected Italians. He had the best military intel spy network in the ancient world, as long as he had the silver from Spain to do it. Uh, now, notice what the Romans renamed the Mediterranean after they took it from Hannibal. Mare Nostrum, our sea, not their sea any longer, our sea. Now, look at Spain, and you can see right here that heavy... Uh, even on a satellite map, you can see that it's rich in metallic minerals and oxides. You might know Rio Tinto uh, over here, too. Rio Tinto, the painted river from iron oxide. Spanish steel was really good. The silver from Cartagena. They had a huge uh, area of metallic metalliferous uh, metals, rich in stuff. You can just see, uh, even today, what's left in Spain. The silver, the gold, the copper, the tin, the zinc. Uh, and gold comes with mercury, silver comes with lead, copper comes with arsenic. Kind of interesting that the three noble metals have some toxic counterparts. Uh, but that's what the Rio Tinto looks like even today. Uh, now, uh, Phoenician mining has been there for millennia, literally. Long time. And you can just see here the mines around Cartagena. Here's Cartagena, Cartago Nova in the Roman sense, because they took it and renamed it. And you can just see parts of the harbor. It was a very good natural harbor. Even the Spanish submarine force is based there because it's such a deep port. You can see the extended marina. I took that photo, and you can see uh, the deep port. The submarine uh, port is over off on the right-hand side to the south. That's what it looked like when Hannibal lived there, surrounded by water on multiple sides. That was actually a lagoon, but uh, the Romans only discovered that when Scipio did his own homework. There's a picture from the top of Cartagena. With There you can see in the background, that's where the Spanish submarine fleet is, right back there. So a lot of Phoenician material in Cartagena. That's a picture I took from the hill uh, where Hannibal probably lived there in Cartagena. There's a wall. Now, this is one of the most famous coins in history. It's a Mugenti hoard from Spain. It was either his father or Hannibal minted this coin. It's a Hellenistic portrait, so it's not realistic, but it's interesting. On the, on the reverse side is an African elephant. That kind of solves one of the mysteries of Hannibal's elephants. He had both Asian and African. See the big ears, different cerebrum, and the concave back? That is definitely Loxodendron africanus. So it's a very famous silver coin. Uh, the Romans melted down as many as they could find because they didn't want to be rem reminded about Hannibal. They always had this fear, Hannibal at the gates, Hannibal at the gates. He almost totally beat Rome, but that's a different story. I'm not going to go into that. Spanish metal wealth was amazing. I just saw even uh, at the site of Aquileia in Italy, way up near uh, Venice, one of these Carthaginians lead ingots because the, the silver and the lead, when the silver was exhausted, the lead was, lead was what remained. And even in Greenland ice today, you can find lead isotopes uh, from the lead of Cartagena. So a lot of material wealth. Now, Spanish silver wealth, as I said, Hannibal was successful as long as he had that. Notice I'm just going to show you a little bit statistically. Uh, Punic silver extracted from the Cartagena, one mine alone, the Bibolo mine, could have 135 kilograms a day. 135 kilograms a day at its peak. Now, if you work that out, that means 45,000 kilograms in a year, basically not too far from $24 million worth of bullion. So that's how Hannibal bought his military intel. That's how he paid his mercenaries. And as I said, he was successful as long as he controlled those mines until Scipio went and took Cartagena. And his successes ran out. But... Uh, this is a silver denarii coin hoard we found in the Alps. This is just part of it. 
We found it in 2003. We weren't looking for it. The silver from these Roman coins can be traced by rare earth elements to Cartagena. That's a given. Now, uh, the two greatest emperors in Spain were the two greatest emperors in the Roman Empire. You know Trajan and Hadrian were the heyday, the acme, the pinnacle, the zenith of Rome, and they came from Spain, and their families had wealth from Spanish silver. So the story uh, can go on and on. Now, that's what you see today. Can you see the lead oxide, the white tailings there? Uh, not a very healthy place, uh, but that's what's left since the silver is pretty much gone. And I took that photo, and I could even smell uh, the fumes when I was standing on that pile of tailings. I didn't stand there very long. But now, Hannibal had, as I said, a multicultural army. You can just see some of the different peoples here. Uh, he had uh, Celtiberians. That's one of the deadly swords they had, the Falcata. Uh, Dave Baker, a Hollywood metallurgist and sword maker, made one for us for a movie, uh, a documentary in Hollywood. And we could chop through fetal pigs with one slice. And they're pretty rubbery, uh, nasty swords, heavy weighted to the front. And they maimed a lot of Romans. Uh, he had the best cavalry in the world. Many people think the Numidian cavalry horses are the predecessors of the Arabian thoroughbreds today. That gave Hannibal great mobility. I could go on and on. He also had the Celt allies who were great champions at one-to-one -one battle. They weren't so good at organized fights, but boy, they could take you on one-to-one. -one. Uh, and they were, painted, they were painted blue and sometimes went around naked. But they would come screaming at you. And they loved to decapitate. We have at least stories where they decapitated some of the Roman generals. Hannibal couldn't find the body and head to put back together. Anyway, they also had slingers. And in the great battle of Cannae in 216, Hannibal told his slingers who could take down a rabbit at 200 feet. He said, see that guy over there with the big red tunic under the big legionary standard? Take him out. And they did. And that helped win the battle of Cannae. He also had outfitted two of his battalions in fake Roman armor that, he's, that he'd taken after beating Rome at uh, Trebia and Trasimene. So Hannibal was a master tactician and strategist, and these were just some of his forces. Now, of course, he had the elephants. And that's, that's the story that even Juvenal, the poet, says we'll remember about Hannibal, Hannibal's elephants. Uh, and so having been from National Geographic and others, uh, gone over 35 passes tracking Hannibal. Some of you here have heard me talk about this, I know. Uh, and uh, uh, it's amazing to think of elephants going over the Alps, uh, but they can. Uh, there's even the elephant company in Burma where 40 elephants went over the mountains in Burma on very narrow paths. They have to be coaxed, but they can do it. And they are thick-skinned pachyderm, so... Uh, they, they weren't so problematic. The pass that we worked in for 12 years up in the Alps that we think is Hannibal's Pass, at the base of it was found an elephant tusk. So anyway, I could go into more detail. Now, as I said, some people think I'm obsessed about Hannibal. <laughs> I did a documentary for Spike TV called Deadliest Warriors. Now, most 18-year-old boys know this show. Uh, I was surprised one of my Stanford advisees a few years ago when he first met me with a group of Stanford freshmen, he said, you were Hannibal and Spike TV. I was. Anyway, so yes, that's just photoshopped. So yes, I'm obsessive about Hannibal. But now, in his last years, here we get to the point about, yes, the, the Carthaginians, the Phoenicians, were maritime geniuses. And Hannibal left Carthage after being made the judge there, so it's the, the sophate, like... Uh, Shofet in Hebrew. He went in, in exile. Uh, he went to uh, back to Tyre, and then he became a mercenary uh, advisor to anybody who wanted to stand up to Rome. The Macedonians, the Bithynians, the Armenians. He even got to Armenia. Uh, he was really ready to lend a hand to anybody who would, who would rebel against Rome or stand up to Rome. So now we come to our story about biological warfare. The kingdom of Pergamon was the greatest kingdom in the Near East. They eventually lined themselves with Rome, became a client kingship. But at the time, they were fighting with the Bithynians. You can see Bithynia right here. And in the Sea of Marmara was this battle. Uh, and the Pergamon was an amazing place. 
If you've been to Berlin, you've seen probably the great altar of Zeus there at the Pergamon Museum, named after the material that the Germans took from that museum and from that area, from the site of Pergamon. Uh, it's an astonishing place when you go there. Even the new Pergamon Museum uh, panorama shows this picture on the upper right. A great city, probably over 100,000 people lived in it, and Hannibal, hands down, couldn't compete with them very easily. That's the great altar of Pergamon, which, by the way, in the book of Revelation of, of John the Apocalypse, this is maybe John's reference to the throne of Satan in Pergamon, because it looks like a giant throne. Anyway, it's a huge altar where a hundred bulls were sacrificed in a day, each year on an annual festival. So Pergamon was a great city. That's my picture, the photo I took from the theater. Don't fall there and slip. You'll roll all the way down. And that's Bergamot today, the same city. And you know Bergamot, the perfume? It was originated there. And you know the name parchment? It was pergamentum. It came from this mixture of rag fiber and paper pulp that the Pergamines invented. Parchment from pergamentum. Bergamot. And so many things. It was a wealthy, wealthy city. Uh, and there's my picture of the great library. That was the second greatest library in the world. Mark Antony gave it to Cleopatra and she put it in her library at Alexandria. So Pergamon was a great place. I think we can begin to see that. Now, they had a great navy under Eumenes II, at least three-quarter of a thousand biremes and uh, maybe a quarter of a thousand triremes, great boats, and Hannibal was outnumbered and outboated, shall we say. I won't say outmanned. Now, here's a very quick, brief passage. I know it's probably too, too long to read, but I'm going to read it really quick anyway. Hannibal the Carthaginian hand thus saved his property, deceived all the Cretans, went into Pontus to Prusius, the king of Bithynia, to whom he showed himself of the same mind, uh, and so on and so on and so on. Now, notice uh, he's trying to get a fight against the Pergamines because the Pergamines were allied to Rome. Notice, Eumenes, king of Pergamus, was at variance with Perseus, king of Bithynia, and war was maintained between them by sea and land, for which reason Hannibal was the more desirous that he should be crushed. Notice, Eumenes had the superiority in both land and sea. Hannibal thought that if he could cut him off, his other projects would be easier to execute. To put an end to his life, therefore, he, he basically adopted the following stratagem. Now, there's a book called Stratagemata, written by a Roman, about ancient war stratagems. There are more about Hannibal than any other ancient person in history, even more than Alexander, whom Hannibal admired. So Stratagemata, Hannibal was full of stratagems. The Greek word strategos means general. The word strategy is what you do in war. Hannibal was really good at stratagems. Notice what he said, what he's going to do. They were to engage by sea in a few days. Hannibal was inferior in number of vessels, and he had to use craftiness in the contest as if, because he was no match for his enemy in force. He accordingly ordered as many poisonous serpents as possible to be brought together alive and to be put into earthen vessels. Now, other writers say they were clay, ba they were clay vessels or they were baskets. Uh, we have different, uh, Justin and Strabo say, ba baskets or clay vessels. Anyway, of which, when he had collected a large number, he called the officers of his ships together. On the day in which he was going to put to fight at sea, he directed them all to make an attack against the single ship of King Eumenes and to be content with simply defending themselves against the others, as they might easily do with the aid of the vast number of serpents adding that he would take care that they would know in which ship Eumenes sailed, the king, promising that if they took or killed him, it would be a great advantage. So notice what they did. After this exhortation was given to the soldiers, notice that the fleets were brought out for action by both parties. When the line of each was formed, and before the signals were given for battle, Hannibal, in order to show his men where Eumenes was, dispatched to the king of Pergamon a letter carrier in a boat with a herald staff, you know, the white flag. And the ship, the little boat went right to King Omenes' ship. They found out where he was. They identified the flagship by se sending him with the herald to there. So Hannibal made sure his fleet knew where the king was, uh, even if they didn't before. Uh, that the Eumenes thought that, that this was for peace. Notice the messenger made the king's ship known to his party, returned to the same place from which he'd come. King Eumenes opened the letter, found nothing in it except scorn and ridicule. It wasn't a peace treaty whatsoever. It wasn't a white flag of surrender, even though he thought he had this battle beat. Notice the prince, that prince, as he was unable to withstand 
what this was all about, he basically did what? He started the battle, and so he came at once to battle. In this conflict, the Bithynians, under Hannibal's direction, felt all at once, they fell all at once upon the ship of Eumenes. The prince took refuge. He, he basically pulled back, retreat, but notice what happened. The, the rest of the Pergamene ships came to bear grapple with Hannibal's Bithynian ships, and what happened? The earthen pots in which were previously spoken suddenly were hurled into them, it says here. These, when thrown at first, brought laughter from the Pergamenes. Why are you throwing clay pots at us? Then they broke, and what happened? All these vipers came crawling out through the ships. Notice it says here, when they saw their ships filled with vipers and were startled, they didn't know what to do, so they, they turned their ships around and they retreated back to the coast with the vipers in them. So Hannibal, by this stratagem, prevailed over the force of the Pergamines. This wasn't the only occasion. Often, at other times, he defeated the enemy uh, with skillful stratagems. So there's the story in Nepos. Can you imagine this? Baskets filled with snakes thrown overboard, and it defeated a superior naval fleet. Now, I don't know. This is just my footnotes in the book about it, my Hannibal book about it. But can you imagine this? The first episode of biological warfare published in history and taking advantage of her pedophobia, too. So that's how Hannibal defeated the Pergamines, who had a superior navy, but he had the better mind. And I don't know, know about you. I don't like snakes. <laughs> they didn't either. Well, that's just the story we can tell about Hannibal's naval superiority with a long history of Phoenician naval legacy. Thank you for letting me share this story. Welcome again to our Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Our speaker and guest today is um, the historian Patrick Hunt. Um, it's great to have you here again, Patrick. Um, a few things about these boats. How big were the typical boats, the Phoenicians and then those used by Hannibal in the day? And how fast could they go? They were usually uh, under 250 feet or so. Uh, and it was fascinating. Uh, the, the keel and the ribs, the keel was often oak. The ribs were often cedar. But they were bigger than most everybody else's ships because the trees of the cedar of Lebanon were so big. So they, had, they really had big boats. As far as the speed, uh, it's very likely that uh, the fastest speed they could, they could probably ply was maybe 18 knots, but in a stiff wind. Sailing. Yeah, so <clears throat> against the vectors of the, the current, the water, the draft, and so on. Uh, uh, and as I said, they weren't afraid of the open sea. How many people typically on these? How many crew? Well, you'd, you'd have the naval crew uh, who would handle the rigging, the, the, the oars, because when you... When you come to port, you put down the sail and you pick up the oars. So they had to have oarsmen as well as sailors who could do the rigging, climb, etc. Then they would have different platoons of soldiers. So a ship uh, that's 200 feet long, we think on average, could have about 200 people in it. That's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But that's because of the soldiers. Now, if it was just the mercantile ships, they rarely had more than a, a, a platoon. So maybe... Uh, 60 people maximum on one of these ships if you included all the sailing, the captain, the navigator, the helmsman, and maybe a platoon of soldiers. So, uh, but, but they only carried a huge number of people, like 200, uh, for a, a, a battle where they were either transporting troops or for battle. How old were the, the sailors, the soldiers? Well, the average age in antiquity for... Uh, the lo lowest level soldier, sailor, would be about 16 to 18. And so they had a lot of those, uh, 18 to 20 year olds, just like today. <laughs> and when Hannibal died, how old was he? Probably 63. 
and he took his own life, you may remember. No, no, tell about that. Well, uh, the king of Bithynia, who, Prusius, whom he helped win that battle against Pergamon and defeated a superior navy, uh, was bribed finally by Rome to uh, turn Hannibal in. Hannibal had a fortress on the Sea of Marmara uh, at Libyssa, and it had one gate but six secret entrances. And one night, Hannibal realized he was only left with one faithful uh, follower, one major domo. And the one faithful person said, uh, something's wrong, sir. Hannibal said, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned. So what he did, he said, go check out all of our secret exits. The soldier came back, his, his one faithful officer, soldier, major domo, everything came back and said, sir, there's a soldier standing outside every one of our secret exits. We've been betrayed. So Hannibal had a ring, according to Juvenal, with poison in it. And he took poison because he did not want to be taken by Rome, brought, dragged in chains, humiliated through the streets of Rome. And so he had, on his command, he had his fortress burned down so they couldn't even get his bones, just to try to turn him to ashes. Mm. He did not want Rome to get him one bit. Now, we're going to ask for questions from the audience, and before we take one of those, we've got a great number of questions from uh, Facebook. Uh, Julia, talk to one of the questions or comments. Yeah, there, there a couple of them. First of all, did you personally have any Indiana Jones experiences? <laughs> And like being chased by cannibals or something. Well, my wife is here to verify anything I might say. <laughs> she has been with me on part of these. I've been shot at. I've been on planes that have caught on fire, entire wings. Um, I've been ambushed, attempted kidnaps. Uh, I've broken 40 bones. Wow. I have oh. railroad tracks up and down my arms from surgeries, multiple, you know, uh, ah. titanium pieces and rods. So I guess you could say... Uh, the Explorers Club told me that I couldn't be a fellow elected uh, unless I'd survived at least a 50-foot fall in the Alps. <laughs> <laughs> With an elephant or elephant required? <laughs> well, I was carrying this watermelon with me, or I could say I was carrying a cantaloupe with me that I tried very carefully to keep from dashing against the rock. <laughs> but yes, in the service of archaeology, I've broken many bones. Uh, <laughs> scars, scars everywhere. Those are just the ones I can oh, tell yes. in public. <laughs> it's good. Uh, uh, sort of a follow-on, and it's probably not answerable quickly, but comparing the Phoenicians with the Norwegians and their skills. Yes, uh, there are two cultures that I love very dearly, and the first time Ron had me come speak was on the Vikings right. and Viking ships, and I think half of you had names that ended in Bjornsson or something like that. <laughs> was a requirement but, that day. Yeah, yeah, and uh, <laughs> it was fun because, yes, the ships of the Norwegians uh, and the ships, the strake ships of the Norwegians, ships that could be 120 feet long, uh, uh, amazing Comparanda between the Norwegians and the Phoenicians, yes. How were they different? Well, the water up north would be a lot colder. <laughs> uh, the Norwegians uh, would probably be a little thicker skinned, uh, but they were both very readily able to cross open sea without sight of land. And the Norwegians had sunstones. You know what I'm talking about the calcite spar crystals that double birefract the sun, and they could actually tell direction they were going in, uh, even on a cloudy day, because the sun would still show up on those calcite spars. They were different. Uh, the main difference, I think, uh, was that the Norwegians, the Vikings, and vikinger means wanderers, they were fiercer fighters. Uh, the Phoenicians relegated their fighting to mercenaries. The Vikings didn't. <laughs> uh, great. Um, what was the currency that he used to pay? How did he pay his men? All that Spanish silver. Remember the buy below uh, mine alone on a given day, 134 kilograms of silver per diem in its heyday. So there was a lot. That was just one mine. So they mint that into coins? They minted that into coins and, and, and ingots, bullion. Hannibal always packed his silver on the elephants on his 37 elephants, because nobody would attack the elephants. 
So Hannibal carried that silver, and he would pay his soldiers. He'd buy grain. Uh, he would buy military intelligence. Uh, so really, that silver was key to his success. As I said again, and I say it in the book multiple times, without that silver, uh, Hannibal couldn't have done what he did. And when he lost access to that silver in Carthage, his successes evaporated. Question from Kim Dessenberg. Kim. Thank you, Professor Hunt. Uh, I learned a lot of new words today. Uh -huh. <laughs> and one I didn't understand, you identified some wine vessels using ampelography. Yes, ampelography, it's a good question. Ampelography is what viticulturists do by looking at grape leaves. And they look at the patterns on grape leaves. You know, you can recognize the difference between a Chardonnay grape and a Cabernet Sauvignon, or the, or the Sauvignon family, Sauvignon Blanc, et cetera, Carmenet. You can look at Riesling grape leaves. Uh, we have grape leaves shown. I was just in Trier, Augusta Trevororum in Germany a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I was looking at all the depictions of grape leaves on reliefs, on vessels, and paintings, on mosaics, and even the artists. Sometimes you have to allow for artistic license, but you can actually look at ancient mm -hmm. leaves depicted in art and see if that helps. And so, yes, uh, we can see some comparanda, some comparisons. So what was Hannibal's business model? What did he get for the conquests? Well, what he was really trying to do was beat Rome back, not destroy Rome, even though Rome, we can say, practiced genocide against Carthage. Carthage really just wanted to be left alone with their mercantile empire, and Rome wasn't going to let that happen. Rome already had that manifest destiny of conquest. And a dear friend, Adrian Goldsworthy, who's written the book on the Pax Romana, shows we think about the benefits of the Pax Romana, correspondence, communication, networks, trade, transport, and peace, but it was achieved by very violent means, by conquest. And in the Roman conquests, hundred we can say in, in 100 years of conquest, Rome uh, killed over a million people, enslaved 2 million people, so it was brutal and violent. So we, we know Rome practiced genocide on multiple occasions, including against Carthage, wiped them out. Pretty much the same with the Etruscans, pretty much the same with the Jews of Judea. So what Hannibal wanted was to get Rome to leave Carthage alone, and it didn't work. And what was the population, his population versus the Roman at the time? Well, it might have been a nearly equal if you add all the trade emporia and colonies and so on, but Rome's population was concentrated in Italy, vast resources in Italy, but they wanted to move outside the peninsula, and they couldn't go west because of the Tyrrhenian Sea. They couldn't go east because of the Adriatic Sea. They couldn't go south because of the Sicily Sea. They could only go north up into the Celt-Iberian territory of the Po River Valley. And so they took over Celtic lands, and that's when the Celts called Hannibal to help them out. So I would say population-wise, uh, we don't have a million people living in the city of Rome until you know, the Augustan period. Before that, we could say Carthage might have had a city of, of 60 to 75,000, and each little city around might have been a few thousands of people. But overall, uh, I think probably uh, Rome always fielded double the army size. So I think we could say that uh, in all of Italy with its allies, Rome may have had the superior number advantage. But the city of Rome was younger than the city of Carthage by at least 100 years. What's the significance of it being younger? Well, the, the way that the, the Phoenicians colonized, they were always looking for advantageous ports with really good access to safe water and the maritime trade and currents and winds. Uh, when, it, when you think about the Romans were never really good sailors. They were, they were landlubbers. Tell Anderlini this when you see him. <laughs> uh, it, it wasn't until they started copying Carthaginian ships that they began to get some superior. It wasn't for that, that uh, storm that sunk the fleet of Carthage. Uh, Rome would have been at a disadvantage. So uh, going back to the idea that uh, uh, Rome was bent on destroying. You all heard that phrase many times, Carthago de Lenda Est, Carthage must be destroyed. That was Rome's mantra. Carthage never said Rome must be destroyed. Very different cultures. A mercantile culture versus an agrarian culture. Rome was an agrarian culture. And because it was territorial and land-based, it had to keep growing in land. 
All Carthage wanted were the sea lanes. Perfect. Uh, Paul Kamen, question. Uh, a shift propulsion question here. Yes. Uh, we know about biremes and triremes. And uh, in fact, some years ago, I attended a lecture by the designer. I think his name was John Coates of the trireme replica. And I, I followed that in some detail. Uh, by the way, I think they did eight and a half knots under oars only. Uh, but every Jesus, time- under oars alone. Every, oh every time I see a, a sketch of a quatrième or a quintureme, uh, I just shake my head and say, no, that couldn't possibly work. I'm wondering if the nomenclature of the day, which describes ships by the number of rowers per station instead of the number of oars per station, has been misconstrued. Uh, and the five rowers that might be on one station of a trireme uh, got mistranslated into a ship with five banks of oars. That's a very good question, and, and it may be possible linguistically we've confused the term between oars and rowers. I wish John Hale were here right now. He was at my house for dinner a couple nights ago. John Hale wrote Lords of the Sea, and he's probably the world's expert on that question. And he was a rower at Yale, too, probably helped. Uh, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. he would be able to answer that question better. Uh, John R. Hale. Uh, uh, if you, I can give you his email if you want. So as, as far as we know, there's no hard evidence that there was actually a working ship with five banks of oars. Um, I think that just about anything in academe is arguable. So <laughs> oh, no, it isn't. <laughs> I mean, there, you're going to find someone who's going to argue anyway, even if it's not arguable, right? Yeah. No, you won't. Uh, well, I will. Yeah. I will agree. <laughs> I think we are agreeing that, that this is a perfect, perfect, an excellent, excellent response. Could uh, Hannibal and or his oarsmen swim? I think that uh, anyone like Hannibal, who is raised primarily as a as a, a, a general by land, but raised in a maritime culture, very likely. Hannibal could swim. Uh, we were talking earlier about how they got across the Rhone, the Rhone River. The elephants actually snorkeled their way across. Uh, but many of the soldiers, it was only nine feet deep, uh, but uh, the elephants could definitely swim too. Uh, we know elephants can swim. Uh, Hannibal, we don't have any stories about him swimming, but uh, he was used to the vectors uh, of sea battles, of current and water, uh, wind, etc., cetera, draft, uh, resistance. So I think he could probably swim. Uh, the Carthaginians, by the way, uh, as I said, had a lot of access to flowing water. As I mentioned, they probably had uh, water gravity uh, uh, for their own cisterns. So they were, they were people used to water. One more question from the audience. One more question. Uh, this is about taxes. So uh, I'm wondering, we know the Romans had a tax system. Yes. Um, and then did Hannibal, even though he was a capitalist, have a tax system? Yes. Um, and, yes. and did it differ yes. from the Roman yes. tax system? Excellent question. Uh, we know from Polybius, uh, when Hannibal is forced to go into exile from Carthage, it was very likely his the one person who beat him, Scipio, at the Battle of Zama, installed him as the chief magistrate, the Sophet, in Carthage for one purpose. Because Hannibal was such a good administrator, he was going to be in charge of getting the new penalty extracted from Carthage. And the Carthaginian Garusia, the Council of Elders and the nobles, many of them business people, didn't want to pay their fair share of the taxes. And Hamble was the one who was placed in charge of getting the taxes from those nobles. So Hannibal himself was one of them. So he had to pay taxes. Uh, yes, the Carthaginians paid taxes, but the elite always found a way to pay at a different <laughs> scale. And, and Hannibal... <laughs> Hannibal was forced. Hannibal was forced 
by the Romans to extract those taxes from the nobles of Carthage. And they actually turned him into Rome because of that. And then he had to flee. Remember, Patrick, you're speaking in a yacht club. I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, it, it's an interesting uh, question on tax week, isn't it? <laughs> Two days after April 15th. Well, uh, taxes, uh, definitely. Uh, Hannibal also taxed the people uh, where he landed, where he went. Uh, uh, if he conquered an area, he taxed those people heavily. It's interesting on the basis of what, on their on money they made selling things, like a sales when tax? He, when he conquered a Roman army, he let the Celts go free. He told them to go home. He wasn't their enemy. But he taxed the Romans, and he actually even made them pay a ransom to get free. So uh, Hannibal was well aware in his last days as the chief magistrate of Carthage, the burden of taxes. <laughs> what a great note to end on. Our guest today has been uh, Professor Patrick Hunt, historian and authority on the Phoenicians and Hannibal. Patrick, it's been wonderful having you here. And Ron, with that, our a, luncheon is a pleasure. Assured. Thank you so much. How much fun. How much fun. Always, buddy. Oh.